brother! Okay, a little while ago, we put together a big five-part series discussing the subject of what if James kept the invisibility cloak, with the basic premise is that Harry would have been protected inside of the Potter's home when Voldemort first came to attack. It took us several months here in office, but we know sometimes having everything condensed into one mega saga where we remove all of the intros and recaps and ads is much better for your viewing pleasure. So without any further ado, what if James kept the invisibility cloak? What if James kept the invisibility cloak Part one. Hey, brother! Oh man, do we have a good one for you guys today. What if James had actually kept the invisibility cloak? As you may recall, Dumbledore is in possession of the cloak by the time Harry arrives at school because he borrows it from James to inspect it, suspecting that it was one of the Deathly Hallows. And he is correct. However, this of course means that when Voldemort does attack, James doesn't have access to the cloak. And on some level, this may have felt like giving up a very useful piece of armor, but you have to remember that the entire Potter home is basically under a giant invisibility cloak that is the Fidelius Charm. So it's never felt like that big of a deal, but what if he still had it? Could it have changed anything that night? And you might think, well, just having the cloak on at all probably wouldn't make that much of a difference. I mean, would that actually stop Voldemort from finding one of the Potters? Couldn't he just like take it off them? And the answer is probably, but also maybe not. We obviously get some lore about the third hallow, but not tons of specifics. There is this one line, however, from Harry about this exact situation. The cloak wouldn't have helped them survive though, Harry said quickly. Voldemort knew where my mom and dad were. The cloak couldn't have made them curse proof. And Dumbledore does agree with him on this point, but to me it always reads like he's just letting Harry make excuses for him here. And if Harry is willing to let it go, then there's really no reason to press the issue. I mean, you tell me for context, here's the full exchange. And then your father died and I had two hallows at last all to myself. His tone was unbearably bitter. The cloak wouldn't have helped them survive though, Harry said quickly. Voldemort knew where my mom and dad were. The cloak couldn't have made them curse proof. True, sighed Dumbledore, true. Harry waited, but Dumbledore did not speak, so he prompted him. Do you see what I mean? It kind of feels like Dumbledore has some reservations here. Even if they are not curse proof, if he can't see them, he can't kill them. Maybe they could have just used it to escape the house, or maybe he really just wouldn't have been able to find them at all. I mean, if the legend about death giving the cloak to the third brother is to be believed, then death himself, who the cloak used to belong to, could never find the third brother no matter how hard he looked. Not for nothing, but that makes it sound pretty darn powerful. And not for nothing, but Voldemort looking for you seems pretty akin to death themselves looking for you. <laughs> On top of that, if you don't want to take the lore of the Tale of the Three Brothers seriously, then we can look at two other lines from Dumbledore, who, if you'll recall from the conversation just before, chose to remain silent, but is now revisiting the powers of the cloak. First, and he's referencing himself and Grindelwald here, Both of us could conceal ourselves well enough without the cloak, the true magic of which, of course, is that it can be used to protect and shield others as well as its owner. An excellent point that feels relevant to the situation at hand, concealing yourself may be one thing, but hiding others less capable of such magic, like your infant, who happens to be the chosen one, is the real power. But then in the same discussion, there is also this quote, again, for context, he starts by referring to the Elder Wand. I was permitted to tame and to use it because I took it, not for gain, but to save others from it. But the cloak I took out of vain curiosity, and so it could never have worked for me as it works for you, its true owner. And that is the one that really drives it home for me. It could have never worked for me as it works for you, its true owner. As if there is something unique about the way that the cloak works for Harry, its true master instead of other people. And yet we know it does still work for other people, even if Harry isn't under the cloak with them. Ron appeared out of nowhere as he pulled off Harry's invisibility cloak. He had been down at Hagrid's hut, helping him feed Dorbert, who was now eating dead rats by the crate. Brief aside, where was Hagrid getting crates of dead rats? Did they come pre-dead? I don't know which is worse. <laughs> Ron owns a pet rat. It's gotta suck. Well, that or Scabbers was freaking out that day. That's, yeah, that's the real what if. What if Ron had fed Scabbers to Norbert? Everything's solved. I'm way off topic. The point is, the cloak works for other people, and presumably Dumbledore put it on himself to see how it worked. So what does he mean it would work differently for its true owner? It's an invisibility cloak and makes people invisible. That is the power, right? My body's gone. So if it has to do something more than make you invisible, but also not go as far as to make you fully curse proof, then to me the extra layer it gives its true owner is that it makes you unfindable. 
Think of this like the power of the room of requirement when the DA asked it to be unfindable by Umbridge or the Inquisitorial Squad. Like everything else with the room of requirement, that then became a feature of the room itself. That being said though, and before you mention it, yes, I know Moody can actually see through the cloak, but I think that actually says more about the power of his eye than anything else. The backstory of which I'm sure must also be insane. But anyway, all of that is to say that yes, I do think the Potters, had it been in their possession, could have made effective use of the cloak on the night of Voldemort's attack to the tune of whoever was covered could not be found. And with that groundwork laid, we are now forced to ask the question, what if James never let the cloak to Dumbledore? Okay, so obviously there are a few different ways the cloak could have been used on the night of. Maybe James covers all three of them. Maybe he just covers Lily and Harry, or maybe they only cover Harry as they know he's the intended target. But I think based on what usually goes down that night, that third scenario is probably the most likely. When Harry hears his parents' voices during his encounters with the Dementors, his dad says, Lily, take Harry and go. It's him, go run. I'll hold him off. Now, of course, there is little time to act and they immediately separate with James trying to hold Voldemort off wandlessly. But we know that he buys at least enough time to make it upstairs into Harry's nursery. As such, I don't think James makes it under the cloak and based on what we know Lily does afterwards, I think she would have tried to fight off Voldemort as well and so only covers Harry with the cloak. At which point you might think, wait, James, who would have been the rightful master at the time, didn't do the covering, so will the cloak work for its true owner if Lily is the one who did it? Well, if you will recall from, you know, five seconds ago, James just died, so it's been a rather eventful five seconds because not only is Harry's family under attack, but also the true owner would have just then become Harry following the tradition of the cloak being passed from parent to child. And so I do think it would protect him in the way that we have described and basically make him unfindable to Voldemort, even though he must know Harry is in the house somewhere. It's kind of like his own little private ancient magical artifact powered Fidelius charm tent. Available now at REI. Limited time only. I'm kidding, there's only one and it's quite literally priceless, so. In the meantime though, Lily is still in the house and not about to give anything up and as usual voluntarily dies and in doing so, casts sacrificial protection on Harry. But here's where things get interesting. Voldemort can then not locate Harry in the house and try and finish him off. He searches and searches, but has no luck and in a fit of rage, destroys the house for good measure and flees the scene. The destruction of the house as ever destroys the Fidelius charm though, so others can see it and Hagrid can still come and collect Harry from the ruins. Oh no, but wait, will Hagrid be able to find him with the cloak on? Amazingly, yes. While the protection of the cloak would make him unfindable to Voldemort, it doesn't need to protect him from Hagrid, so Hagrid could either hear him crying or else pull the cloak off and still be able to locate Harry. In fact, this exact explanation could be how either Luna or Tonks, depending on your version of the story, is capable of finding finding Harry under the cloak after Draco stomps on his face on the train. And I bet you thought it was Nargles. <laughs> Raxperts? <laughs> it's Tonks anyway, so who cares? Either way, this means almost everything goes down the same way, but with two major differences. Harry is not marked with the lightning shaped scar and does not become a Horcrux, and Voldemort doesn't destroy himself, failing to kill Harry because he didn't even get the chance. So how do the next 10 years pan out while Harry grows up enough to eventually go to Hogwarts? As ever, he'd end up at the Dursleys where Dumbledore can place the bond of blood upon him so that Voldemort can't find him there either. Which at this point has to be straight up infuriating if you are Voldemort. Like this is the most unfair game of hide and seek that has ever existed. But Voldemort sucks, so no sympathy whatsoever. <laughs> Overall though, this is a much bigger deal because Voldemort never fell. So does that just mean that 10 years later, the whole world has fallen and he's taken over? Well, it probably should mean that, but no, as ever, Voldemort's main concern once he knows about the prophecy is to fulfill it by killing Harry. And he plans on using Harry's death to make his final Horcrux. So he waits with his new plan of luring Harry into the open by creating a false calm. And this may sound unlike Voldemort, but remember his goal is immortality. So days, weeks, even years are on the whole less important to him. 
So he halts Death Eater activity until such a time that Harry will go to Hogwarts, and this is actually similar to what happens at the end of our What If Neville is the Chosen One series as well. But by doing this, the Wizarding World lets its guard down to the point where Harry is allowed to actually go to school. Which actually is part of the plan, because Voldemort has a fantastic way to attack Harry at the school right under Dumbledore's broken nose. The diary. And like, why wait? Just go ahead and plant it right away so Harry doesn't have any time to learn more magic and then you don't have to personally attack. Just sit back and watch. And while Ginny's not at school yet, I think Voldemort can guess Harry will be in Gryffindor based on his parents and will target another kid in his year who's likely to end up there as well. Ron. Ha! Another Weasley. I know just what to do with you. Gryffindor! Those Weasleys. Love their diaries. And as per always, Ron and Harry become besties, but then Ron quickly opens the chamber and the attacks begin. If I had to guess, the first one is on Halloween and hits Hermione, who's going to be off by herself crying in the bathroom because of something Ron said. A little bit of an oopsies. It is worth noting that this go around, Harry can't hear the Basilisk because he isn't a Horcrux, but he still does his sleuthing and realizes Ron is getting out of bed at night and is able to follow him down to the chamber on one such occasion, courtesy of the invisibility cloak. And we all know how this one plays out. Tom Riddle appears, jump scare basilisk. <laughs> fox, hat, sword, you know the deal. Except the sword has an interesting twist. If you're a longtime subscriber, you know that we firmly believe that Voldemort had the sword with him when he went to go kill Harry as a baby. The sword was intended to be the final Horcrux that would complete the set of Founder's Objects alongside Hufflepuff's Cup, Ravenclaw's Diadem, and of course, Slytherin's Locket. But usually he loses it after the attack, at which point it just disappears, as it's known to do. This time, however, he'd still have it uncruxed until Harry summons it to himself in the chamber and swiftly kills the Basilisk with it. And so the diary gets destroyed and Dumbledore is able to learn about the Horcruxes. Overall, a very bad night for Voldemort, who is down a Horcrux and a rare object he was going to make into a Horcrux, plus that Potter kid is still alive, but... And now, what is Voldemort to do? Well, the good news for him is that even though this was a failure, it wasn't a very public failure. And as far as the public is concerned, he's been dormant for 10 years. So he he can still operate pretty good in secrecy. Unfortunately, he doesn't have another great way into Hogwarts, but there is a very public widespread wizarding event just on the horizon he can hope to capitalize on, the Quidditch World Cup, which will be fittingly hosted in Britain. As it is already, the Death Eaters get up to fun here in the main story, but this time around, way more of them will be at large, and it really can be like a coming out party for the dark side. For Harry, that means he gets two pretty regular years at Hogwarts where nothing too crazy actually happens. He just goes to school and learns things. Boring. <laughs> but during that time, with things being slower, I think Dumbledore makes significant progress on his Horcrux research. Either way, that lands us at the Quidditch World Cup. Harry and friends attend. Hermione is still, of course, a bestie after the whole chamber situation. Ireland wins, but Crumb catches the snitch. Celebrations ensue, but then... Dark marks appear everywhere. Unironically this time. They weren't really ironic the first time, just, you know, more dangerful this time. Security around Harry was, of course, tight, but absolute chaos ensues as panic breaks out everywhere. Death Eaters are openly attacking civilians and causing damage, spreading orders, and ministry officials thin. So when Harry and company find themselves in the clearing, they don't discover Winky the house elf, but instead, Voldemort in the flesh. Harry, of course, reaches for his wand, but it's not there. Usually, Barty Crouch takes Harry's wand in the top box almost by accident just because it's right there in front of him. But obviously, this time, he never got sent to Azkaban in the first place. But with years of planning, Voldemort has now instructed Barty Crouch Jr. to steal Harry's wand during the match to ensure he's without a weapon. So, with no defense, Voldemort doesn't hesitate. Time to die, Harry Potter. Havana Kedavra! Havana Kedavra! And then Voldemort's world implodes. What's left of his soul is ripped from his body, which withers away beneath him. Somehow, his spell has backfired. He's nothing but pain and terror, and he flees. At the sight of Voldemort's defeat, the uncaptured Death Eaters retreat and scatter to the winds. Barty Crouch Jr. is not among them. He's been caught, and Harry's wand is recovered. Harry awakes the next day, having somehow survived the Avada Kedavra curse with nothing more than a large, sprawling, lightning-shaped scar across his chest. Much more macho. <laughs> <laughs>
Usually Lily's sacrificial protection kicks in immediately and is put to the test just moments later, but this time it's been well over a decade and the protection still lingers, meaning as ever, Voldemort's spell backfired and Harry has left the boy who lived. Okay, so following the Quidditch World Cup, Harry suddenly finds himself the boy who lived, the boy who took down Lord Voldemort. And while a certain amount of that would have been present before since Voldemort appeared to disappear after attacking Harry's parents, but now there's much more public display of his defeat. For sure he's gone now, right? <laughs> Obviously not, and Dumbledore is aware of that right away as he knows of Voldemort's Horcruxes at this point, but certainly for everyone else, it's a time to rejoice. Especially with the Triwizard Tournament on the horizon, what fun! Dumbledore still hires Moody because he knows Voldemort will come back someday and wants Harry to be prepared. The big difference is that this time it actually is Moody because nobody's actively trying to kill Harry. Probably. Voldemort thought the job would be done at the Quidditch World Cup, so nothing was considered for the Triwizard Tournament in advance, meaning one huge change for Harry this year is that nobody puts his name in the Goblet of Fire, so he's not in the tournament. Instead, and get this, he's just like the most coolest, most famous boy ever that just defeated Voldemort with a super macho lightning scar on his chest. By the way, if you have no idea why we keep using the term macho, it's from this one line from Ginny when Ramil Devane asked if he had a hippogriff tattoo. I told her it's a Hungarian horntail, said Ginny, turning a page of the newspaper idly. Much more macho. And for some reason, macho has just always stood out to me as like the single most out of place word in the entire saga. Macho. Oh yeah! Or, you know what? Hamburger shows up like seven times in the first seven chapters. Anyway though, full of such machismo, Harry is very popular and attracts the attention of none other than Flor Delacour, which hilariously also means Ron is likely agitated with Harry again, but let's be real, he's also super impressed. You know, I like it when they walk. And he's even more impressed when the Bobaton champion asks Harry to the Yule Ball, like what? Harry being asked by one of the other champions makes Hermione a little bit more open about being asked by Crumb, and so it's not such a big shock on the night of for Ron who goes with, you guessed it, Parvati Patil. Seamus asks Lavender, you guys, duh. And with Parvati available and in Gryffindor and his two best friends having dates that actively want to dance and have fun, all three of them actually have a blast. Wow, what a neat change up. It does always bump me out a little bit that I don't have more fun at the Yule Ball. I mean, the Weird Sisters are there. The Weird Sisters! Little do they know that the Durmstrang headmaster, Karkaroff, is a Death Eater, and it turns out Harry being Fleur's date to the ball is just the information he's been waiting for. As you might expect, Voldemort is trying once more to return to his physical form, but unlike last time, he has a much more ready and capable group of Death Eaters he can rely on to assist him. Like, Bellatrix isn't in Azkaban this time. This is a huge asset to Voldemort because if you'll recall, there is a certain object Voldemort usually goes for first to get his body back, the Philosopher's Stone. And Bellatrix can pretty easily get into the high security section at Gringotts because of her own vault, at Gringotts. But the issue is timing. Once and if this stone is stolen, the jig will be up and Dumbledore will be onto him at once. Plus, Voldemort needs a way to get around the sacrificial protection, a problem he usually solves by taking Harry's blood, and that is his exact plan this time. And that is why Karkaroff's information is so valuable, because for the second task, Harry will be the thing Floor misses most and who she'll be attempting to rescue from the lake. And thanks to Karkaroff, Voldemort will learn this information. Like, how convenient, right? The person he needs to kidnap will be fake kidnapped by the Mer people, meaning he needs to steal Harry from them. An overall much easier task considering he'll be unconscious as long as the Death Eaters can figure out how to breathe underwater, which is an apparently like almost unresearchable task. Seriously, why is this one so ridiculously hard to figure out? Like muggles know how to breathe underwater. Like Gillyweed has got to be a much more like prominent thing. No, but I'm sure the Death Eaters can do it no problem. The trick is getting the timing right so that they can steal the stone and kidnap Harry inside of the same window. This is, of course, so that Voldemort can produce the Elixir of Life, mix it with Harry's blood, and come back capable of attacking him. And with Karkaroff's information, this ends up working out well for Voldemort. They know exactly when Harry is in the lake, and Bellatrix is able to steal a stone successfully. 
Is that where actually explained how Voldemort knows where the stone is in Philosopher's Stone, but he does. So I think we can assume he still does. And Quirrell almost got it the first time. And he's terrible compared to Bellatrix, who's much more capable, has a way in and is much darker. So yeah, I think she gets it pretty easy. The other tricky part though, is that without the port key in the maze, Harry is pretty much stuck at Hogwarts. So once he's out of the lake, they have to do everything in the Forbidden Forest, which they also have snuck into likely with Karkaroff's help. I'm not gonna lie to you guys, the hardest part about writing this particular concept altogether is just that I have to give Karkaroff like more credit than I really want to. Either way though, here's what I imagine happens. Hermione and Harry, and I guess Cho, are collected the day before the second task, just like Ron and Hermione usually are. They are taken to Professor McGonagall's office where she explains everything. They're to be placed under an enchanted sleep and to be collected from the bottom of the Black Lake by their champion. They are assured it's completely safe and at no point will their lives be in danger. Harry and Hermione exchange a nervous glance with each other and close their eyes to be placed into the sleep. Harry wistfully thinks to himself that at least the next time he opens his eyes, he'll be looking up at Fleur Delacour and all goes black. What feels like only a moment later, Harry reawakens as he's forcibly dragged from the edge of the Black Lake, frozen and clothes stuck to him. He looks up at the masked faces of two Death Eaters, also dripping wet as they move clumsily towards the Forbidden Forest. Harry struggles for his wand, but in the mingled state of shock and through the grip of the Death Eaters, he's unable to reach it. Meanwhile, far off in the distance, a cannon marking the start of the second task fires. <laughs> Then, after what feels like forever and Bramble Scratch from the forest floor, the trio finally emerge upon a clearing filled with hooded figures, an ominous and wretched dark cloud, and positioned directly in the center on an old tree stump glows a bright red stone. Harry is forced against the tree and ropes fly from another hooded figure's wand, binding him tightly. The tree, by the way, probably looks remarkably similar to like a grim reaper, even though it's supposed to be a headstone for like a mogul man. Silence fills the space until a terrible voice carries through the clearing. Harry Potter has come to die. The dark cloud seemed to have spoken, and as it did so, it was condensing into an almost solid wall of black vapor. Harry had been freezing, but all at once felt like his body was on fire as the scars on his chest seared with pain. Harry looked up to see that the cloud had formed the rough silhouette of a man and was standing just feet away from him. Then suddenly one of the figures around him produced a knife and slashed open Harry's hand, which was then forced onto the glowing stone. It was now dripping in his blood. The cloud positioned itself over the stone and all at once seemed to condense around it. Lightning seemed to crackle from every direction and suddenly a bright red light burst causing Harry to shield his eyes. Then to his horror, the cloud seemed to take on a solid form. It slowly shifted back into the shape of a man and it looked more like a scarecrow on fire with smoke billowing away at an alarming rate until it had all burned off and all that was left was a man, Lord Voldemort. Confused, Harry, I'm not surprised, but you see, Lord Voldemort cannot die. And just months ago, I was forced to consider that you shared this quality of mine when my spell backfired at the Quidditch World Cup. Disgusted by what he was witnessing, Harry fought against the restraints to no avail. I thought that I had you. It must have been some mistake. You were unarmed, but my spell recoiled against me, ripped me from my body. Pain you cannot imagine. But as always, I am surrounded by my faithful Death Eaters, witnesses to my temporary defeat. I explain to them my vital mistake, a piece of ancient magic, protection placed upon you by your dying mother, her sacrifice. He spat the last word. Meanwhile, back in the lake, Floor has reached the bottom first after absolutely just wrecking some Grindy Lows on the way down. Harry had taught her all about them from what he learned from Lupin back in year three. But she realizes something was horribly wrong. Cho and Hermione are still there, but Harry is missing and several dead mer people lay on the bottom of the lake floor. Horrified, she races to the surface and alerts the judges. In the woods, Voldemort finishes monologuing. But no matter what, I can touch you now. He presses his finger into Harry's chest, which threatens to explode with pain. And now, Harry Potter, we duel. Let there be no doubt to anyone who the stronger wizard is this time. Harry's restraints are released and he stands reaching for his wand, which is mercifully still in his pocket. And you could probably guess what happens next. Priori and Cantatum, the twin cores meet. The difference is that they are in the forest rather than the graveyard and Dumbledore and friends are on their way. Able to quickly spot them with Moody's eye, all that separates them is distance, which they are closing in on fast. 
Meanwhile, Harry successfully forces the golden bead back into Voldemort's wand, an ear-splitting scream erupts from it. That's Voldemort's own spell backfiring at the Quidditch World Cup, followed by the emergence of James and Lily Potter. Help is on the way, Harry. We can buy you some time. Run for the castle. The connection breaks and the surrounding Death Eaters are too stunned to move as Harry sprints towards the castle, but doesn't have to go far before he sees help running towards him. The Death Eaters and Voldemort spot Dumbledore in the distance and flee in every direction into the forest. Harry collapses into Dumbledore's arms and all he can say is, he's back. He's back. End of part two. Oh wait, actually also Floor gets 50 points for outstanding moral fiber. Now end of part two. Hey brother. You may have also noticed that I am uh, not Ben because on top of the rest of it, he has just also been sick this week. So he asked if I could fill in, which of course I was glad to do. But anyways, thank you guys so much for waiting for part three here. So let's just dive on in. Okay, so following the chaos in the Forbidden Forest, there are some overall pretty massive implications within the Triwizard Tournament. Not the least of which is the fact that Karkaroff fled with the rest of the Death Eaters, leaving Durmstrang and even more specifically, Crumb with out a headmaster. But it doesn't matter that much because the tournament ended up playing like directly into Voldemort's plan and therefore it is considered too much of a risk to continue it. So the champion is crowned based on the results of the first and second task where Floor happened to absolutely crush it enough to take the crown. Yay, moral fiber. So Floor walks away 1,000 galleons richer. Huzzah! Although I guess that means the startup money for Weasley Wizard Weezes goes with her, so kind of a bummer. I like to think her and Harry are still keeping in touch though with letters, kind of like Hermione and Crumb were like, maybe it's gonna happen, I don't know. In the meantime though, there's a considerable amount of strife between Dumbledore, who was present to witness the return of Voldemort, and the ministry that has been riding the wave of being the administration that led to the downfall of the Dark Lord less than a year ago at the Quidditch World Cup. Gotta say, pretty short-lived victory, and uh, you didn't really have anything to do with it, so. But it means the Ministry is not exactly jazzed to hear that their problems aren't actually over and there's actually a ton more work to do. Ugh. But don't you worry, they're not gonna just pretend Voldemort's not there. They have a much different plan this time. But don't worry, they're still gonna be a nuisance. Voldemort coming back though means Dumbledore has gone hard to work seeking out the remainder of the Horcruxes in the time following the events of the Forbidden Forest. And he continues this quest all throughout the remainder of the school year, leading up to weeks before Harry is slated to return to Hogwarts for his fifth year. And it is then, just before Harry's return to school, that Dumbledore writes to him to let him know that he intends to personally take over Harry's Defense Against the Dark Arts training upon return to school. In like an extracurricular capacity, he'll still have to go to regular class. Now, normally Dumbledore waits until after Harry has heard the prophecy to begin Harry's personal training, trying to, you know, postpone the end of Harry's childhood as long as possible. Which even in the main story, it's like, yeah, I'm I'm sure Harry was just loving that childhood with Quirrell and the Chamber of Secrets and the being hunted by a convicted felon and being abducted into a graveyard. Like, come on, Dumbledore, he's grown up, dude. But because Dumbledore's been hunting the Horcruxes earlier, he has found one earlier too, the Gaunt Family Ring, AKA the Resurrection Stone. And as usual, Dumbledore forgets himself and tries it on only to land himself with a one year lifespan as the curse slowly begins to kill him. Thus, he needs to teach Harry as much as he can and as fast as he can, but he can at least postpone telling Harry about the prophecy itself and just say he's training him because he's positive Voldemort will try and kill him again and he wants him to be prepared. <laughs> That said, we also know that Voldemort's usual move after the Priori and Cantatum failure is to seek the rest of the prophecy, and that Dumbledore usually guesses, or is else informed, that this is Voldemort's plan, and of course, he does not want Voldemort to get it. So, Dumbledore goes to the Minister of Magic, yes, Barty Crouch Sr. <laughs> 
<laughs> Did you think it was gonna be Fudge? Well, it's not, because as we all know, Barty Karch Sr. was on the fast track to become Minister, if not for his son being found out as a Death Eater following the fall of the Dark Lord. But this time, the Dark Lord did not fall at the same time and his son was never found out. So yeah, he would have just become the Minister and not Fudge. Dumbledore, of course, has to keep his cards close to the chest, but does at least tell Barty Crouch Sr. that Voldemort will likely try to break into the Department of Mysteries. So maybe you should place some like extra guards down there, like just in case. But Crouch does not like that he is not being told what the prophecy is, especially since it sounds a lot like it will help him defeat Voldemort. Like it should be Dumbledore's duty to tell him what it says, right? Obviously Dumbledore won't be doing that, but it won't take long before Barty realizes Harry could also retrieve it because his name is on the prophecy and he will try to make this happen, which Dumbledore also does not want to allow. But seeing this behavior as borderline treasonous and eager to keep an eye on Dumbledore and Harry, Crouch installs a new Defense Against the Dark Arts professor at Hogwarts, Dolores Umbridge. It is super annoying that she's such an effective person at doing the things she's trying to do. Like, she's so terrible, but like, that said, Umbridge is in a somewhat different position this year, like political alignment wise, because normally she is pro-ministry and anti-Harry, meaning that she refuses to acknowledge that Voldemort is back. This time though, the fact that Voldemort is back is much more common knowledge, so while she's still extremely pro-ministry and maybe anti-Dumbledore, the ministry itself is anti-Voldemort, so perhaps she's a somewhat more effective teacher. <laughs> hate the very idea of it. In fact, I assume she just performs all the curses and stuff on the students and enjoys the power it gives her over them. Blech. In any case though, Dumbledore begins Harry's lessons at the start of the year and decides to hold them instead in the room of requirement because this go around, there will be a different element to their lessons. And before you ask, yes, we know that Dumbledore knows about the room because he uses it in Fantastic Beasts like 50 years earlier, so. Boom. As for the lessons, usually they're just diving into the pensive and they still will, but this time Dumbledore will also be teaching Harry more dueling techniques, so more room will be needed. And you might be wondering like, wait, why does Dumbledore need to teach him to duel if he doesn't normally need to? And... Don't worry, I'll get to that later. In the meantime though, let's talk about Horcruxes because there are some interesting things to consider. First of all, because of Dumbledore's early head start, as we said earlier, he's already found and destroyed the ring and identified the cup and locket as likely targets. He would also still have a theory that there is something of Ravenclaw's but not know specifically that it's the diadem. And then as for Nagini, she wouldn't even be in play because normally she comes about while Voldemort is in hiding, but he wasn't really gone this time. And then we have Harry. Is he's still a horcrux because normally after Voldemort like blows himself up in Godric's Hollow, a piece of him latches onto Harry because he's the only living thing nearby. This time that all happened at the Quidditch World Cup, which is certainly more populated than Harry's childhood bedroom, but Harry I think would still be the closest person nearby and I don't really see why the outcome would be any different. So yes, Harry does still become a horcrux just much later in life. Which is important because it means that as Voldemort dwells on the Department of Mysteries, so will Harry, even if he doesn't know why. And now usually Voldemort discovers the like self same connection between him and Harry after Harry sees through Nagini's eyes to save Mr. Weasley. But again, Nagini is not in play this time. So Voldemort's not likely to discover this, or at least, at least not in the same way. Instead, Harry is just left to wonder endlessly about the door without ever even having seen it this time. Like normally he sees it when he goes to trial before school, but that wouldn't have happened. So now he's just dreaming about this door. Even without ever having seen it, he can still put together what is behind it. A prophecy concerning himself, which he can piece together because of Umbridge. Has asked me to remind you Remember, her motivations are to serve the minister and he, again, Barty Karch Sr., wants Harry to go pick up that prophecy. That is his big goal. Umbridge, of course, encourages Harry to comply with these requests, which, of course, he denies on Dumbledore's orders and, you know, just good common sense. Obviously, nothing the toad lady wants him to do can be good. 
duh. But that doesn't mean she's not able to plant the seeds of curiosity in his brain. I mean, it's not unlike what Lucius tells him in the main story. All the answers are there. Bottom. In your hand. And it all adds up to just a truly difficult year for Harry, who was constantly dealing with Voldemort dwelling on the door, and he himself developing all of the same questions and wondering if all of the answers lie there as well. I mean, the temptation is high. And in case you're wondering, yes, Voldemort will still be trying to steal the prophecy, but he also does not want to go in there himself. And not only that, Barty Crouch Sr., despite having all these disagreements with Dumbledore, is still listening to Dumbledore's advice about guarding it. So yes, Voldemort is held at bay personally. But what's making things even harder for Harry is that in the meantime, Dumbledore is not telling Harry what the prophecy says, only that he will know eventually and that the ministry and the greater wizarding world will not benefit from having access to the information. And you know, just trust him, I'm Dumbledore after all. I just, I, I, I got it. So frustrating though, am I right? Like, you know what it says and you won't tell me? Like, jeez. But Harry can't complain too much because under Dumbledore's tutelage, he is getting extremely good at dueling and learning some pretty cool magic. But no matter what he learns, Dumbledore maintains that often the simplest solution in a duel is the best, and thus much focus is put on disarming. Expelliarmus! <laughs> Of course, as great as these lessons are, they aren't as frequent as Harry would like because Dumbledore is prone to leaving the school for large swaths of time and while he's away, Umbridge starts to get up to her usual tricks. After Harry won't willingly comply, she of course turns to her other favorite form of persuasion pain via bloody quill and writing lines, but her message to Harry this year is different than I must not tell lies. Instead, she seeks to remind him that he is not special and he's endangering the world by not complying. And so she has him write, I serve the greater good. And it takes a while as usual for this message to actually start forming a permanent scar on Harry's hand and unwilling to give Umbridge the satisfaction that it's bothering him at all, he doesn't tell Dumbledore this is happening. But it does continue to happen because Harry continues to refuse her. Then when Christmas rolls around without the attack on Mr. Weasley, Harry just spends the holiday at the Weasleys as he is eager to be as far from Umbridge as possible. Wouldn't you know it, he gets a surprise visitor from none other than Barty Crouch Sr., the Minister of Magic himself, who has now decided to take matters into his own hands. But this goes similar to how Harry's meeting with Scrimgeour usually goes, and he tries a lot of the same tactics Umbridge tried early on, you know, promising Harry answers and protection and the knowledge that he's assisting wizarding kind in defeating Voldemort. It's a real morale booster, you know? Harry, however, is not sold. He can still feel the pricks on the back of his hand and is super over the ministry just at the moment and refuses telling him anything, telling him that he is Dumbledore's man through and through. I don't know about you guys, but I always really just love that scene when he tells Scrimgeour that. Crouch is disappointed, but not surprised, and decides that the only way he is going to get through to Harry is to drive some kind of wedge between him and Dumbledore. And so, similar to Fudge, he turns to the press. Unlike Fudge, Crouch has access to a very specific reporter who is not presently trapped in beetle form inside of an unbreakable glass jar. Rita Skeeter. In the meantime, however, Harry returns to school where Dumbledore finishes teaching Harry what he knows about Voldemort's past and lets him know that he thinks he is close to locating another Horcrux and that Harry may accompany him if he does find it. Harry is of course elated to hear this and tells Dumbledore about his meeting with Crouch and tells him about the greater good message slowly appearing on his hand. Dumbledore is of course enraged that Harry has been harmed in this way, but proud of him for not breaking. And knows there isn't much he can do to get rid of Umbridge, but he can at least make sure that such punishments come to an end. 
fueled by their desire to defeat Voldemort and refuse the Ministry, Harry and Dumbledore proceed to have their best dueling session yet, and Harry even manages to end it by landing a spectacular Expelliarmus on Dumbledore, who is just beaming with pride. Now, you may have noticed that Slughorn has not been present thus far for Harry to, you know, steal his memory and confirm that Voldemort was aiming at a seven-part soul, which is... Yes, unfortunate for the sake of confirmation, but this is also the number Dumbledore is guessing anyway, which he happens to be right about, so I think we're okay on that front. Actually, we totally will be. Harry has other ways of confirming the numbers, but we'll get to that. But for the next couple weeks, things seem to be looking up for Harry. He's confident in his dueling, a horcrux is perhaps on the horizon, and his hand-based punishments have mercifully come to a stop, as promised. But then, at dinner one night, the evening post arrives while Harry is at dinner, and Hedwig has brought with her a copy of the Daily Prophet with an alarming headline. Albus Dumbledore and the so-called Greater Good. Yes, it turns out Rita has done her digging and turned up some truly not so lovely information about Dumbledore, all to do with his summer in Godric's Hollow and the infamous dark wizard Gellert Grindelwald. The article is basically the chapter from the main story in the fuller biography, The Life and Lies of Albus Dumbledore, and Harry is horror-struck as he reads the words on the page. The letter Dumbledore wrote to Grindelwald, and the back of his hand begins to prickle again. He immediately seeks out Dumbledore to confront him about the article and to get to the truth of the matter, but when he walks in his office, he is surprised. Ah, Harry, you're sooner than I expected. I see you got my message, Dumbledore says brightly. What? responds Harry, taken aback by his tone. What message? No, I'm here about this, he says, throwing the paper on his desk. The color fades from Dumbledore's face as he takes in the article. Well? demands Harry. Is it true? Harry, this article represents a summer from my life I am least proud of. I am sad to say it is true, and I promise you a full explanation, but just now I am afraid we have more concerning matters at hand. I have located another Horcrux. And suddenly all the anger in Harry's mind is joined by overwhelming excitement and curiosity. I know the timing's not ideal, and I assure you I will give you a full explanation of this article, but I plan to try and retrieve the Horcrux tonight, and would like to offer you the chance to accompany me. I can come with you, Harry says, somewhat stunned. I promised you that you could, just as I am promising you the truth when we return. Harry can't quite separate the betrayal he feels about the article from the act of trust being offered to him in the moment, but knows for sure he wants to get the Horcrux, and so he decides to go. And so they journey to the cave, where you kind of know what happens, except it's all happening a year earlier. They break the enchantment, sail across the Lake of Inferi, and arrive at the basin of the Drink of Despair. Dumbledore drinks the potion, suffering horrible agony as he does so, and Harry collects the false locket. One difference I will note this time around, though, is that when they're sailing back and the Inferi attack them, Harry is able to put all of that training to good use and summons a truly giant vortex of fire to drive them back. Then, once out of the cave, he apparates back to Hogsmeade and gets Dumbledore back to the hospital wing, where he looks truly dreadful. His dead hand lays at a side. He's coughing and barely breathing, and Madame Pomfrey looks like she thinks he isn't going to make it. And it is in that moment that Harry realizes how badly Voldemort needs to be stopped, the kind of damage he's capable of inflicting, and that if there is anything he can do to relieve other suffering, he must do it. And so he goes to Umbridge and tells her he's ready to help the Ministry. And, of course, she's surprised, but immediately leaps into action, sending an owl to Barty Crouch and taking him through her fireplace flu network to the Ministry. Harry is quickly escorted by Crouch and several oars to the Department of Mysteries, where suddenly the door from his dreams looms before him, and as it does, a horrible pain screeches across the lightning scar on his chest. Harry staggers, but continues on, convinced of the correctness of his decision to learn the prophecy. And then there he is face to face with the glowing ball, his chest burns again as he reaches out for it and then grabs it. 
Crouch is ecstatic, truly believing this is the answer he's been looking for to defeat Voldemort, and he quickly suggests that they head to his office to examine the contents. Harry hesitates, but thinks of Dumbledore damaged, lying in bed, and agrees, and so they make their way out of the Department of Mysteries. But as they do, they are confronted by a squad of Death Eaters. Dun dun dun! The Dark Lord felt your presence here, Potter. You have something there he greatly desires. Fights break out all over as the Death Eaters attack, attempting to retrieve the prophecy. Run! Crouch yells at Harry. Protect the prophecy! Harry does so and manages to pull out his invisibility cloak, which he still has on him from the trip with Dumbledore. He hides beneath it and makes his way to an elevator, dodging spells as he goes, but manages to board one unnoticed. The door is open on the main level. Harry spies the fireplaces and makes to run for them, but Crucio! The spell hits Harry from beneath the cloak, and Harry falls to the ground in pain, stares up in horror at the face of Voldemort, the scar on his chest searing with pain, the prophecy dropped. I thought so, says Voldemort, staring down at him, lifting the prophecy to himself. I suspected you might be hiding, Potter, and cast my spell just to be sure the carriage was empty. I must thank you for retrieving this for me. I have wondered about its contents for years. Now, let us see what the future has in store for Lord Voldemort. Though, I must say, I don't need this to tell you your future, Harry. You will die here tonight. I have brought another's wand with me. There will be no protection from the Twin Cores this time. Voldemort voice. <gasps> Voldemort lifts the orb at long last to hear the prophecy. Hasio! Suddenly, the orb flies out of his hand and towards the fireplaces where Dumbledore staggers out. He's limping and wheezing, but catches the prophecy with surprising grace. Dumbledore, says Voldemort, hate dripping from every syllable. How good of you to join us. I'll kill you first, then deal with Potter. Harry watches in horror as the two begin dueling, and it's magic the lights of which he's never seen. Giant fiery snakes, huge golden statues, spells flying everywhere. The two appear nearly even, but Harry can tell Dumbledore isn't fully recovered from the drink of despair. He's slowly losing ground, and then trips. Hasio! Voldemort yells, and the prophecy returns to him. And now... Crucio! No! Harry yells, and before the curse can land, he shouts, Protego! at Dumbledore. The curse slams into the invisible shield and shatters it with a deafening blow, but Dumbledore is safe. Fury in his eyes, Voldemort now turns on Harry. Perhaps you'd like another dose of pain. Voldemort raises his wand, but as he does so, Harry's wand raises itself to meet his, shooting an eruption of golden fire that dwarfs the inferno Harry cast earlier. The borrowed wand in Voldemort's hand is immediately consumed, his hand horribly burnt, his eyes blinded by the light. He lifts his other hand to shield his face, but in doing so, drops the prophecy which shatters on the ground. Anger erupts through Voldemort, which Harry feels in his scars, but wandless and without the prophecy, there is nothing to do but fear. Flee. Harry collapses in pain and Voldemort makes his escape. Back at school, Harry finds out what happened down below. Most of the Death Eaters were captured, but not before the Minister of Magic was murdered by his own son, Barty Crouch Jr. Dumbledore managed to get Harry back to school, but has been in a terrible state since returning. The potion in the cave, the curse on his hand, and the duel with Voldemort have brought him to death's door, and he's using his remaining time to tell Harry the truths that he promised him. He tells him the full contents of the prophecy, that he, Harry, is the chosen one that his wand likely produced those golden flames because it was supercharged whenever it's targeted at Voldemort, and that he must hunt down the Horcruxes and destroy the one they found if he has any hopes of killing Voldemort in the end. And as for his summer with Grindelwald, he asks Harry for forgiveness. It is one of his greatest regrets. He was tempted by power and rationalized it with the greater good. Harry thinks of his own actions the night before and blames himself for forcing Dumbledore to come to his rescue, but Dumbledore says it's his own fault for not being more forthcoming in the first place. He tells him that Harry's rationale was to truly save lives while his own was just to gain power and influence. But most of all, he tells Harry how truly remarkable he is and that he loves him, that he's proud of him, and then he passes. 
Heading into year six at Hogwarts, Harry has some advantages he doesn't usually have. Like, for one, there are less Horcruxes, and although he doesn't know it yet, he has pretty easy access to the true locket, so that hunt shouldn't actually end up being all that hard. As for the cup and the diadem, he has very little to go on at all, though unbeknownst to either Harry or Dumbledore, they were quite close to the diadem during their lessons in the Room of Requirement. Meanwhile, in the greater wizarding world, the last year has shown a ministry that, while a thorn in Harry's side, they were at least very anti-Voldemort, with the very strong Barty Crouch Sr. at the helm. This year, though, Barty Crouch and Dumbledore are both dead, and therefore there is a bit of a power vacuum in the wizarding world and at Hogwarts, which Voldemort is keen to pounce on. The circumstance is most going to resemble what we see during Harry's seventh year, where the Ministry falls during Bill and Fleur's wedding, where the death of then Rufus Scrimgeour as minister leads to Pius Thickness being turned into an imperious puppet in his stead. And of course, one Severus Snape being named Hogwarts Headmaster, with key Death Eaters, the Caros, being installed as additional teachers. This go-round, I think we will see a combination of those particular outcomes, but it'll still go a little bit differently. But before any of that can happen, we have to start where we always do, at the Dursleys. And as ever, this is vitally important to maintaining the Bond of Blood charm, but also as ever, it's not essential for Harry to spend the entire summer there. Given the lack of known trustworthy leadership at the Ministry and Voldemort's surge for power, there is growing concern about not only Harry's safety at the Dursley, but the safety of the Dursleys themselves. Meaning, finally we get a proper introduction to one, the Order of the Phoenix, who thus far have played a quieter role compared to what we've seen in the past, and two, Sirius Black, who had not been to Azkaban, but has mostly existed in a state of solitude at number 12 in the wake of losing his friends. The night of the Potter's death, he would have, of course, realized that Peter had betrayed him and tried to hunt him down, the main difference being that he can't find him because this time Voldemort doesn't fall, so he is still able to protect Peter. Thus, Sirius is not framed for murder, but also never takes over as Harry's godfather because the protection available at the Dursleys is so much more ironclad, and without Voldemort actually falling, the protection is of much more vital importance, even if Voldemort is pretending to disappear for those 10 years. So, Sirius has lost all of his friends, who he holds the most dear, is blaming himself for suggesting Peter be the secret keeper, and can't even properly contribute to Harry's protection. He has been very depressed for a long time. He is, however, given brand new life and purpose when the day comes to collect Harry from the Dursleys and provide him safe haven in his own home. But what's absolutely wild is that this go-round, this is the first time Harry is ever meeting or even learning of Sirius's existence at all. And right away, Sirius explains that he was bestowed the honor of Godfather over Harry by Lily and James. However, because the Bond of Blood provided such a powerful protection over Harry while he was at the Dursleys, it was agreed that his identity will be kept hidden from Harry, lest he seek out Sirius for his guardianship. Which, face it, he totally would have. I could never have imagined how they would treat you. If I'd known, I never would have agreed. But after the role I played in your parents' death, I didn't consider myself fit or worthy of raising James's son. Such terrible, but also such serious logic. He would go on to tell Harry, I know you've been working directly with Dumbledore, and I understand completely, and if you cannot share the details of those meetings. He would, however, be available to help in any way that Harry required. This scene, in my head personally, is a bit of a contrast to Remus's offer to help Harry in Deathly Hallows, where Harry usually gets very upset at the prospect of Remus leaving his family to, you know, chase adventure. But this time, hearing Sirius' story, the clear signs of his self-imposed imprisonment, and Harry's own intuition that there was nothing that mattered more to Sirius than to provide Harry with any aid that he was capable of, Harry decides that he can trust Sirius with at least some information. So he doesn't tell him about the Horcruxes in full, or even the locket itself, but having by this point discovered the note inside the fake locket, asks him if he knows anyone with the initials R.A.B. And to Harry's utter shock, this request gets a loud barking laugh out of Sirius, who says, of course he does. R.A.B. were the initials of his own brother Regulus, who had become a Death Eater before being killed trying to desert Voldemort. And all of that information immediately fits the rest of the note, and Harry realizes that one of the Horcruxes he'd been looking for might somehow be inside the very house he's now staying in. 
So Sirius shows him Regulus's room and Harry immediately begins to search every nook and cranny of it and in almost no time at all recovers the true locket. And I know, I know, that sounds super convenient, but that's as easy as it would have been if Grimaud Place hadn't needed such a ridiculous cleaning. But this time it of course wouldn't because Sirius just would have been there the whole time. They even handle it in the main story and just pass it by. There was a musical box that emitted a faintly sinister tinkling tune when wound and they all found themselves becoming curiously weak and sleepy until Ginny had the sense to slam the lid shut, also a heavy locket that none of them could open, a number of ancient seals, and in a dusty box an Order of Merlin first class that had been awarded to Sirius's grandfather for services to the ministry. And speaking of convenience, Snape didn't kill Dumbledore this time, meaning Harry probably still doesn't like him very much, but doesn't have an overwhelming 100% reason to believe he's working for Voldemort. And because normally Dumbledore like knows that all of this is going to happen ahead of time, so he has to like figure out a way to plan around it, he doesn't have to do that this time. He can just trust Snape to deliver a certain object to Harry after his death, the sword of Gryffindor. So shortly after Harry's arrival at Grimald Place, Snape appears at the door. Potter, Snape drawled. The headmaster wished you to have this after his death. What does he want me to have it for? Harry asked. He seemed to think you would know what to do with it and requested come see me after you have completed your assignment. Wait, why? What do you need to tell me? Why can't you do it now? Good day, Potter, Snape replied unhelpfully as his cloak swished and turned to leave. But just because Dumbledore doesn't have to rely on the will to get Harry the sword, he does still leave Harry, Ron, and Hermione the usual objects, the snitch, the tales of Beetle the Bard, and the deluminator from the will, which are swiftly delivered as well by the new minister, Rufus Scrimshower. And despite Harry's initial confusion over the sword, he, Ron, and Hermione pretty swiftly figure out that he's supposed to use it to destroy the Horcrux which they successfully do to the locket almost immediately. Boom! One down and they didn't even have to poorly plan how to break into the ministry, which incidentally is like my least favorite section of any of the books at all. We're gonna use Polyjuice Potion three times in the final installment of the series. Like we could probably 86 one of those, right? We have a problem. Polyjuice! It's not clever if you do it too often. Unfortunately though, that is usually their only lead. So the big question is like, what now? Well, back over in Voldemort's camp, Voldemort is recovering from his latest encounter with Harry, which, if you will recall, involved him getting burned pretty badly from Harry's super awesome golden fire. Sick burn, Potter. Yeah. Seriously, this hurts really, really bad. <laughs> No so as it turns out, Harry has left Voldemort with a scar himself that usual magic doesn't seem to be healing, and as a result, Voldemort is in constant and terrible pain, which, as you can imagine, he hates. Fortunately though, he thinks he has a solution deep within the vault of Gringotts, where he is storing one of his most valuable treasures, the Philosopher's Stone, the very object that gave him back his body, and which he thinks can cure him of this pain. The, the problem, if you're Voldemort, is that this pain is so severe, it starts creating the unintentional pathway between Harry and himself. Meaning if you're Harry, you're constantly feeling those chest scars prickling. Because as a reminder, if the scars are on his chest this time, much more macho. This otherwise fairly new connection becomes even more dangerous for Voldemort, who travels to the Lestrange vault, hoping the stone will cure his burns. Physically, maybe they can, but emotionally, He's doomed. So sure enough, upon contact, the stone's properties spring to life, providing Voldemort with such relief and elation that the connection becomes wide open and Harry is able to take in Voldemort's surroundings. He can glimpse inside of the Lestrange vault and to his absolute astonishment, he sees the cup. Now, of course, the issue is how in the how are they going to break into Gringotts and actually steal the cup? Well, as it were, they actually have one more advantage than usual in this particular regard. Normally, they have access to Bellatrix's hair from Malfoy Manor, which gets them into the bank and behind the door, but also, like, hardly, because it still ultimately requires the use of an unforgivable curse, so. But this time, they are living in the home of the otherwise never-before-arrested heir of one of the most pure-blooded families in all of wizard kind, 
Sirius Black. So yeah, buddy, Harry is able to disguise himself as Sirius this go around for their entry into the bank, and in an effort to really secure the disguise, or if there's any pushback from the goblins, even takes Sirius's wand. And you might think like, why doesn't Sirius just go with them? And it's a good question, but the answer is that Harry is still keeping all the Horcrux information close to the scarred chest, except for Ron and Hermione, who he usually always trusts anyway. I said usually there as if he doesn't always trust them anyway. He always trusts them. Fact. Sirius doesn't love the idea, but of course does love a little rule breaking and adventure. You've done beautifully and agrees to let them use his hair, and so the planning commences, along with a lot of Ron turning the lights on and off and Hermione reading her new fairy tale book. Classic! Maybe Creature even whips them up some delicious salmon, since it never occurred to them to eat fish in the normal story, you know, like, Asio Salmon! Went real heavy on the L pronunciation. Salmon. 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 <laughs> Slightly different story all of a sudden. <laughs> Was looking for a fish, accidentally summoned the white wizard. So. That's Saruman. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. <laughs> Maybe he's useful. I think he's a pretty bad dude. Yeah, no, he is, he yeah. is, yeah. He's probably on Voldemort's side. Yeah. Meanwhile, though, now that his burns have been healed, Voldemort sets off on his next mission of procuring a more powerful wand that can overcome Harry's annoying Phoenix Feather one, the Elder Wand. And as it turns out, his hunt is significantly easier this time, though, because as usual, he tracks down Gregorovich pretty quickly and obtains the memory of the golden-haired thief. Normally, he gets stuck here for quite some time, but this time, the article about Dumbledore and Grindelwald has already been written and was a front-page story rather than buried in some, like, lame biography by some author nobody knows about. And if I know one thing about Voldemort, that guy never misses the Evening Prophet. He does it for the puzzles. Wormtail! I'm doing the wordle. What's a five letter word that starts with S and ends with K-E? So when Voldemort sees the golden haired boy though, he knows exactly who it is and where he needs to go to question him. Back at base though, Harry, Ron, and Hermione finish their plans to rob Gringotts and it's as elegant as it usually is. Polyjuice up, fly by the seat of your pants and fly by the seat of those pants. Hermione. When have any of our plans ever actually worked? Disguised as serious, Harry arrives at Gringotts with his trusty companion, who I like to call definitely not Ron Weasley, what are you talking about, bro? And Hermione under the invisibility cloak. Harry presents his wand to the goblins and asks to visit his vault. All is going according to plan when suddenly Harry is struck by a vision. Voldemort is questioning Grindelwald, asking him for information about his wand. Harry snaps back to reality with suspicious eyes all around him. Your wand, Mr. Black, says an impatient voice. Harry fumbles for it and extends Sirius's wand to the goblin, who is able to verify it as authentic. Oh, wow, like a, like a PSA 10, even. <laughs> It has been used in 10 years. <laughs> they move forward and start the breakneck journey to the deepest vaults below. Harry clings to the cart when another vision flashes before him. That wand will never be yours. There is still so much you don't understand. Grindelwald laughs and then there is a flash of green light. What is it? Definitely not, Ron Weasley asks. He's looking for a wand, a more powerful wand. And then whoosh, a torrent of water pours over the cart and suddenly Harry's potion is washed away. Not Ron fades back into, whoa, no way, it was actually Ron the whole time? I'll be the first to say it, they had me fooled. They're also all thrown out of the cart and hurtled to the cavern floor where Hermione saves them with a cushioning charm and quickly imperiouses their driver to take them to the Lestrange vault. Ultimately, this will actually buy them a little bit of time because the goblins think they're going to the Black Vault. But as per always, they make it inside of the Lestrange vault where they very quickly learn that Gringotts vaults are also protected from within. The Gemino and Flagrante spells are ignited and the crew is being buried in burning hot treasure. Brief aside, what a way to go though, right? Buried in treasure? Not so bad. Good news, Harry has already had a look around the vault and knows roughly where the cup is and is able to loop it onto the Sword of Gryffindor. Given their head start on locating the treasure, they're actually able to exit the vault before things start to get too hot and heavy in there. Like, because of the flaming treasure, you guys get your heads out of the gutter! Anyway, obviously Harry is now shirtless, scars on full display. That water was cold, y'all. Look it up, it's canon! No, I'm actually still kidding, but he realizes he needs to tie up one more loose end, the Philosopher's Stone. So quickly he tosses the cup to Ron and turns back to the vault with sword in hand. The vault is still filling with molten treasure, but near the back he can just spy the bright red stone that brought Voldemort back. 
A quickly narrowing path looks navigable enough if he acts fast. Without any hesitation, he makes a run for it, carefully to avoid as much treasure as possible. Then, knowing he only has one shot, brings the sword down hard on the stone, and it shatters. Triumph fills Harry, and he stares in amazement as the sword of Gryffindor transforms from a bright silver to a lustrous gold. This moment of pause is costly, though, as he moves for the exit, but suddenly a large plate lands on his shoulder, scalding him. He runs for the exit, but the once narrow path is gone, and treasure is raining down from above. Throwing caution to the wind, he sprints through the now knee-high molten treasure floor, but it's no good. The heat is too intense. He looks for something large on the surface, that he could make a good foothold and spots another plate. Focusing hard on the plate, he makes a leap, but his foot slips on a coin underneath and he falls, the newly gold sword flying from his hand. Wingardium Leviosa! Harry hears Ron shout, and suddenly he finds himself floating towards the door. Harry desperately reaches for the sword, but has completely lost track of it, and suddenly finds himself outside the vault, collapsing on top of his friends. And y'all know what happens next. Gringotts guards, dragon, escape, yada yada, very routine. It's no fun when things go exactly as they always did, you know, we gotta like, change stuff. <laughs> Meanwhile, though, back at the ranch or something, Voldemort has arrived on the grounds of Hogwarts. He knows just what he needs and right where it is. The White Tomb is open and the Elder Wand is taken. A moment of victory courses through him when all of a sudden he feels the dark mark burn. Gringotts, the boy has been there. It has been taken. He knows. Fear floods through his body as his mind races through the rest of his horcruxes. The ring, the locket, the diadem. He must check them all, double the security around them. Harry sees all of this unfold in Voldemort's mind as well, and coasts to the sky on the back of the dragon. He knows what the final horcrux is and that they need to head to Hogwarts. Voldemort's first order of business is to visit the vault and confirm the loss of the cup and the security of the stone. As Voldemort arrives, the Flagrante and Gemino curses have worn off, and the remaining treasure are easy enough to sift through. The remnants of the stone are easily spotted, as is their uselessness. No matter, he thinks to himself. It was only ever a feeble tool of immortality, a mere trinket. Rage, however, breaks over him as he confirms the cup has been lost, and the goblins around him cower as he explodes in anger. But what is this? Voldemort thinks to himself as he spots the gleaming golden hilt protruding from a pile of coins. He pulls the sword and examines the rubies, sparkling in the candlelight. It is not as history describes, but there can be no mistake. Yes, now we see how fate favors Lord Voldemort. His eyes scan the name etched into the goblin forged blade. At that moment, Bellatrix arrives at her own vault and screeches to a halt. My lord! Her voice trembles. Your failures have cost me something dear today. It is only fair that you should pay an equal price. Fear floods Bellatrix's eyes as she realizes the full impact of his words and there is nothing for it. Voldemort turns and in an instant, Bellatrix collapses on the floor, dead. So with the Elder Wand in one hand, sword in the other, Voldemort enters an almost trance-like state, performing complex maneuvers. A small silvery mist exits its body and is absorbed into the sword. The glittering red rubies flicker once before suddenly erupting into a violent shade of green, and a new horcrux is born. Voldemort, certain that the security of Gringotts can't possibly be breached again, and that additional security will be added to the Lestrange vault, Voldemort seals his new golden horcrux inside the vault and exits Gringotts intent on checking on the safety of all of his other horcruxes. Certainly the boy couldn't have discovered them all. Back on the dragon, Harry has been privy to the creation of the new horcrux and its placement inside of the very vault they just robbed, and suddenly his victory in recovering the cup feels kind of fleeting. There's just no way they'll ever be able to break into Gringotts again, and now the one weapon they had against the Horcruxes has become one. On top of that, the memory of Voldemort's recovery of Dumbledore's wand is fresh in his mind. What difference does a wand make? Have either of you ever heard of a more powerful wand? Harry asks Ron and Hermione. Of course not, Harry. Don't be silly. A wand is only as powerful as the wizard using it, Hermione responds. Except, of course, for the Elder Wand, Ron says, laughing at his own joke. This joke, however, is met with unusual stares from both Harry and Hermione. Harry looks like he doesn't understand the reference, and Hermione is kind of taken aback. How do you know about the Elder Wand? She asks. The Elder Wand, he repeats. You know, the tale of the three brothers. It's one of the objects death gives the three brothers. The 
the wand, the resurrection stone and the invisibility cloak, Hermione finishes. Right, so you've read it, and the Elder Wand is supposed to win you all duels and be the most powerful wand ever, worthy of the master of death or something. It's a kid's story. Why do you look so shook? I think we can all safely assume that this revision of the story is being written with like modern vernacular. No cap. I have literally no idea if I used that correctly. Anyway, it's just that I've only just read about it and that book Dumbledore left me. Why are you asking about a powerful wand, Harry? Dumbledore left you a book about a powerful wand? Because Voldemort's been looking for one and he just stole Dumbledore's. The three quickly exchange nervous glances as if checking if the others are thinking the same thing. Dumbledore had the Elder Wand. It's impossible, Harry. How could he have? Hermione asks. But Harry's mind is racing ahead, fitting the pieces together. Grigorovich, Grindelwald, they used to know each other. The legendary duel, Dumbledore won. And then Voldemort's potion, the curse and the ring, the duel at the ministry, and he killed Dumbledore. But there's more to it than that, he says, thinking out loud. If the wand is real, the other two items must be real too. The stone and the cloak. He stops mid-sentence. It's mine. My cloak, it's one of death's gifts or whatever. It's special, that's why I couldn't be found as a baby. Voldemort was in the house, Dumbledore knew, and the stone. Harry reaches into his bag for the snitch. Certain Dumbledores left it inside with the ring, but try as he might, he can't open it. We didn't really cover all of Harry's Quidditch stuff in year one, but rest assured it all went down as you'd expect with like the big mouth catch and such, and he's solved at the snitch to that point, but still can't solve the eye open at the close part. But it makes no difference, Harry. You still can't kill Voldemort if he has his Horcruxes. And even if you have these two gifts, he still has the wand. Hearing the word Horcrux seems to trigger something in Harry's mind, and he can suddenly see Voldemort checking the gaunt shack for the ring and head for the cave. We have to get to Hogwarts. There is something of Ravenclaw's there. Getting to Hogwarts is significantly easier since the entire ministry isn't after Harry this go round, and while Snape is still headmaster, Harry can at least fall back on the knowledge that he did give him the sword, even if it was just at Dumbledore's request. Even so, they decided it would be best if they don't alert Snape to their arrival just in case, so they apparate to Hogsmeade and decide to enter the school via the secret passage in Honeyduke, so yes, the twins still gave Harry the map. The issue is that once inside the castle, they don't know where to go. All Harry knows is that he saw in Voldemort's vision some kind of tiara thing with Ravenclaw's symbol. I know it's at Hogwarts, but I've never seen anything like that here. It was on a kind of bust of some kind. The three spend some time exchanging ideas, but the school is full of statues and they can't think of anything concrete. I just heard myself say it, the full of statues, can't think of anything concrete because statues are made, you get it. Well, then it must be somewhere in the castle we've never been. Is there anywhere like that? Harry thinks again, but it's Ron who speaks up. The Chamber of Secrets, Harry. Seems like a great place to hide something, doesn't it? Only his heir could get in and nobody else knows where it is. Harry considers this, but decides against it. He wouldn't hide one that could be discovered with the other. It's just too risky. But you've given me an idea, Ron. You're brilliant. The Fangs, the Basilisk. They quickly realize there are at least three obvious rooms that they never would have visited inside of the castle. The other common room. They reason out pretty quickly that the Pufflepuff common room is the least likely as they already have the cup and Voldemort otherwise has the least connection to it, but that leaves either Slytherin or Ravenclaw that could make sense. So at once, Harry and Hermione set off to find McGonagall while Ron heads for the chamber, because don't forget, he's the one who actually opened it back in part one. He's not very great at parcel tongue, obviously, but he's confident enough that he can fake his way in. Meanwhile, Voldemort has successfully checked the gaunt shack and confirmed the loss of the the ring and is on his way to the cave to check for the locket. Harry spots McGonagall in the corridor. Professor, we need to get into the Slytherin and Ravenclaw common rooms. Voldemort is coming and we need to find something we think it could be hidden in there. McGonagall is of course flustered by the surprise news and arrival of Harry and Hermione, but naturally accepts the severity of the situation with grace and pivots into general mode. Pierre Totem. Locomoto. She instructs Hermione as to how to access the Ravenclaw common room and with a nearly imperceptible smile says that she'll be confident that she'll be able to answer the door's question. As for Harry, she says she will escort him to Slytherin's common room and demand the students clear out as he's likely to have enemies down there. So Harry produces the invisibility cloak to hide beneath, which she is appropriately impressed by, like, whoa, totally didn't see that one coming. Get it? Because you're invisible. 
<laughs> McGonagall humor is the best. It's good to see you. Not. Once the common room is clear, Harry sets off to look and McGonagall goes to alert the rest of the staff about Voldemort's imminent arrival. The real question though is how will Snape react to this particular development? Because usually everyone believes he's killed Dumbledore at this point and pretty much hates him and they take this opportunity to expel him from the school. And while they're successful, it hurts their cause because Snape actually needs to talk to Harry. This time, however, his allegiance appears to still just be with the Order, which, to be fair, it is, but Voldemort doesn't know that. So they trust him and he does at least help mobilize some defenses in the school. Harry finishes his search of the Slytherin common room and realizes that whatever it is he's looking for just isn't there. But by now, Voldemort has had another flash of rage in the cave and has realized the truth about the locket. He's on his way. Time is up. At this point, he remembers what Snape told him back in Grimmauld Place about coming to see him after he's completed his assignment. Clearly, it was instructions from Dumbledore about the Horcruxes, even if Snape didn't know what he was talking about. Obviously, the assignment isn't actually complete yet, but realizing time is up and out of leads, he decides it's his next best bet and heads for the headmaster's office. To his surprise, Snape is waiting for him at the bottom of the spiral staircase. With me, Potter, he turns to the gargoyle and states the password, Blood Pot. We totally loved the idea that Snape kept with the tradition of using candy as the password, and he's always described as being so bat-like, which made us think of vampires, but let's face it, Snape saying the word pops is probably our biggest, like, reach in the whole what if. Snape eating a, a cake pop from Starbucks. <laughs> Do they come in red? As Harry enters the familiar office, he notices one obvious change, the portrait of Albus Dumbledore hanging over Snape's desk. Have you completed your work, Potter? Snape drawls. No, sir. We've completed several parts, but not the whole thing, Harry says, hedging his information, unsure how much Snape is aware of. But it doesn't matter now. Voldemort is on his way here. Whatever you need to tell me, now is the time. Snape takes a deep breath considering the situation and turns his back to Harry. He stares up into the portrait of Dumbledore, which gives him a curt nod and Snape sighs. He looks more defeated than Harry would have thought possible. And so at long last, Snape reveals the truth about overhearing the prophecy, his role in Voldemort's attack on his parents, his undying and frankly inappropriate love for Lily, and his promise to always protect Harry. Always. Sorry for clarity, Snape doesn't include the inappropriate part, I just threw that in there so that you know that we know. Good? He tells him this so that Harry will trust him when he tells him that a part of Voldemort lives inside of him, and that for Voldemort to fall, so must Harry. You've been raising him like a pig for slaughter. Waves of emotion wash over Harry as he tries to take it all in, but in the time it's taken to learn all this, the attack on the castle has begun and there is simply no time to dwell. Harry understands what must be done and stares up into the portrait of Dumbledore himself as if searching for answers and suddenly, one hits him. The sight of Dumbledore reminds him of the last time they were together in the castle, training in the Room of Requirement, and it hits him. That's where the Horcrux is. He may have to die, but he can do everything he can to bring Voldemort closer to death as well. I know what I need to do, he says aloud to the portrait, which smiles down at him, and then ever so briefly it flashes its eyes towards the shelf in the corner. Harry looks and spies the old tattered hat and gasps. Professor Snape, can I... Take this. As Harry re-enters the corridors of the castle, the sounds of the ensuing battle can be heard everywhere, and to his absolute astonishment, he finds Hermione just outside the door and explains about the room and how Voldemort would have needed a place to hide the Horcrux. Hermione, who looks impressed, then pauses and whispers to herself, where do vanished objects go? Realizing Harry is looking at her, she confirms she didn't find it in the Ravenclaw common room, but she knows what it is. The lost diadem of Ravenclaw. There was a statue of her wearing it, and now Hermione at least knows what it looks like. Together, they race to the room of requirement and ask it to summon a room to hide things. The door appears, and they enter, astonished at the vast number of items. Harry immediately starts scanning for the bust he saw in Voldemort's vision when they see it. Hesitantly, Hermione reaches forward for the diadem. But how are we going to destroy it? She asks. Harry grins and holds up the sorting hat. It worked for me once before, back in the chamber. Stepping back, he reaches into the hat, waiting for the sword to materialize. Hermione holds her breath, but nothing. Defeated, Harry stares down at the very hat that placed him in Gryffindor all those years ago. I 
I was so sure. Hermione also stares at the hat, then back at Harry. Where do vanished objects go? Uh, what? Responds Harry, confused. The riddle, when I went to Ravenclaw Tower, it asked me, where do vanished objects go? It's how Ravenclaws get into their dormitory. They have to answer a riddle. Except this time, I think maybe Ravenclaw was trying to tell me something. Vanished objects go into non-being, which is to say, everything. Hermione was talking so fast, Harry could barely take in everything she was saying. Harry, we can use fiend fire to destroy this. I read about it. It's powerfully destructive, but also completely uncontrollable. I would never use it otherwise, but this room, it's full of vanished objects. If we let it loose, the diadem will be destroyed and we can leave. It will be gone. Contained. Hermione takes the diadem and places it on the floor. With their backs to the door, she raises her wand and casts the spell. Fire erupts in the form of a giant serpent, engulfing the space in flames. They watch as it tears through the room, and at the very last moment, step backwards into the castle corridor as the door seals shut and morph back into castle wall. They exchange a look of triumph when they hear a blast from a staircase down below. The castle is fully under siege. They race through the chaos and find Ron, who is clutching Basilisk's fangs. The cup put up a fight, but it's gone. Brought these back for whatever you guys found. Did you find it? Well done, Ron, says Harry. It was the lost diadem of Ravenclaw. Hermione took it out with fiendfire. It was unbelievable. Harry steps back to take in his best friends who had followed him so far. We won't be needing the fangs, though. With both Ron and Hermione present, he explains everything. How Snape overheard the prophecy, but changed sides in the end. How he tried to summon the sword with the sorting hat, but it didn't come. But most importantly, how he, Harry, was the other Horcrux. You'll have to finish what I couldn't. Harry says. Ron and Hermione move to speak, but the castle wall behind them explodes and the battle is upon them. They turn just in time to catch sight of Harry throwing on the invisibility cloak and disappearing into the chaos. It doesn't take long. Voldemort is at the center of the action in the Great Hall. Harry rips off the cloak wordlessly to face him. Once again, he stands unarmed, save for the sorting hat, still gripped in his hand. Voldemort spots him immediately. All dueling stops at once. There is nothing but silence. Voldemort lifts the Elder Wand. Harry simply stares. And you know what happens next. Harry opens his eyes to the pure white of King's Cross Station. Dumbledore appears, explains his relationship with Grindelwald, how he came to win the unbeatable wand, whispering almost to himself, the wand chooses the wizard. Before Harry knows it, his whole body is in pain. He's lying on his face flat on the castle floor. There is silence still all around. Voldemort is telling his followers to step back for some reason. Murmurs fill the hall. Voldemort has fallen too, and they are helping him up. Snape is at his side. Check him! He demands. Harry can hear Snape's footsteps approach him, castle rubble crunching with each step. He can hear muffled crying all around him as the defenders of Hogwarts mourn his apparent death. Harry feels Snape by his side. His pulse will give him away. Harry had survived, but as soon as Snape reveals the truth, he has no protection left. Snape doesn't check his pulse though. Instead, as Snape leans over him, he feels something heavy appear on his chest. Harry can feel him sliding something from beneath him. The sorting hat? It couldn't be. Unable to resist, Harry opens his eyes a fraction to see what's happening and catches a glint of gold and green. Voldemort is watching in utter astonishment as Snape rises again and turns the golden sword of Gryffindor in his hands. Alive, he shouts. Rage explodes from Voldemort as Snape's true loyalties are finally revealed and green erupts from Voldemort's wand. But Snape lifts the sword in time. The spell collides with the golden blade. An explosion of light seems to erupt from the sword and Snape is flown backwards, but the sword clatters to the ground where he stood, black smoke billowing from it. The blade remains a vibrant gold, but the green fades back into red. The Horcrux is destroyed. Harry is back on his feet. He takes one glance at the invisibility cloak, but with Dumbledore's words ringing in his ears, he knows he doesn't need it because the wand chooses the wizard. It's over, Tom. All the Horcruxes have been destroyed. You've just destroyed the last two yourself. Surrender now before you make yet another mistake. Mistake? No, Potter, but it all makes sense now. When I fell at the Quidditch World Cup, a piece of myself found its way into you. You have used my own soul as a shield against me, 
but there is no one left to die for you this time. Not even me. Harriet raises Sirius's wand, ready for the attack. Ah, I see you don't even have your Phoenix wand. Then you are truly defenseless. You see, I have procured a wand of great power, the Death Stick, the Wand of Destiny, the Elder Wand, and it will be the last thing you see. Harry's mind isn't in the Great Hall, it's in his final lesson with Dumbledore, in the Room of Requirement. After months of training, Harry had finally done it. He just hadn't known what at the time. Voldemort lets out one last massive, Avada Harry thinks of Dumbledore holding Sirius's wand and returns, Expediamus! And it works, exactly like it had against Dumbledore, the moment Harry had become the master of the Elder Wand without ever knowing it. Voldemort's spell backfires, and it's over. And that is what would have happened if James hadn't let Dumbledore the invisibility cloak. Pretty basic stuff, really. <laughs> We want to give a massive, massive, massive thank you to Keith Creevy09, who first submitted this question to us. We had no idea what a journey it would ultimately take us on. We also know that throughout the series, you all came up with some amazing questions. We put together an FAQ video featuring both Jay and myself, where we will do our darndest to tackle all of those for you. Big questions were things like, why couldn't all three, James, Lily, and Harry, hide under the cloak? And do Floor and Harry end up together in the epilogue? And much, much more. You can check all of that out right here, but otherwise, until next time, bye!